Welcome to this session. We have with us Dr. Shashank Shah, who's, uh, who was earlier a visiting scholar at the uh, Harvard University and was a fellow at Harvard Business School. Uh, he's a best-selling author. He's uh, written three business books. Dr. Shah, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Kumar. Thanks for having me here. You know, this has been an interesting time, um, Shashank. Uh, you know, what are some of your uh, key learnings from the pandemic, from the lockdown, in terms of the way organizations and leaders have responded uh, to the challenges? Right, right. I think uh, there are several learnings uh, which have emerged during the course of this pandemic. And I'd like to share a few of them just to highlight how some of these things were very natural responses to what happened uh, in mid-March 2020. So I think one of the first uh, responses was the financial contributions which came in uh, from large corporations. Uh, for example, the Tata Group and the Tata Trust contributed about 1,500 crores, uh, followed by Wipro, which contributed about 1,100 crores. And then Aditya Birla and Reliance contributing about 500 crores together accounting for nearly one third of the total con corporate contributions to the PM Cares Fund, which was uh, almost 6,200 crores in the first quarter. So this was a phenomenal uh, outpouring of financial support, the financial muscle that some of these large corporations had. And I think industries like the CII converged the efforts of many smaller corporations and together benefited about 80 lakh people through equipment and resources. Uh, this is also a time when several uh, uh, numbers have emerged. For example, we are not even aware that India employs nearly 50 lakh sanitation workers who are providing essential services. We hardly bothered about them in the last many, many decades. Uh, the other aspect of the financial contribution, I think, came from the MSMEs. We have over one crore MSMEs in India. While they may not have been able to make the financial contribution like the big conglomerates, their key contribution was that despite their uh, premises, their enterprises being shut because of the lockdown, they continued to pay partial or near full salary to their employees so that their households uh, keep functioning. Uh, for example, I've seen my own father who has a shop in the, in the Mumbai cloth market, which is shut for almost eight to nine months but very, very consistently over the last uh, nine months, he's been paying salaries. And that has kind of kept the employees uh, above board despite the lockdown. So I think that is one very key learning that at such times, financial contributions can play a very important role. I think the second one is about a change in the business model. Uh, most IT companies, which are among the most people intensive business model companies, moved from what was earlier the offshore or the onshore model to now what they called a no-shore model where cross-functional teams achieved efficiency of co-located stuff, but now through distributed delivery mechanisms. The third part I felt which was very important, which I personally believe is important, but kind of emerges during such times is communication, both internal communication and external communication. Now the internal communication here was of what the organization stands for and what it is committed to do for its employees and society at large. And this was delivered, I think, through awareness and sensitization programs about the lockdown, about hygiene and personal sanitation and protection and so on and so forth. I think with respect to external communication, some of the companies like Hindustan Unilever have done a fab job. Uh, they have their uh, uh, scale, they have a great uh, leverage with the public because of the kind of products they've been, been dealing in, uh, which are mainstream products uh, with nearly uh, 40 to 50 percent of India consuming their products, uh, uh, either the personal care products or the household care products. And uh, Hindustan Unilever, for example, collaborated with UNICEF for a mass communication campaign uh, to inform and empower the general public. And both brought what they held as their competence Unilever brought its marketing expertise and UNICEF brought its technical knowledge with respect to public health and it was kind of a win-win. Then there were services offered of a different kind. For example, you mentioned the Tata Group on which I have written my latest book, The Tata Group, which has uh, become a national bestseller. Uh, the Taj Hotels, uh, known very much for their hospitality services, were now providing services of a different kind. They became the first hospitality space 
uh, to make their premium premises available for housing doctors uh, who were on COVID duty from as early as the first week of April. And along with that, for the next quarter, they, their, uh, their uh, subsidiary company, Taj Sats, which deals with uh, the menus in most uh, uh, premium airlines, they distributed 20 lakh meals uh, to medical staff in metro cities like Mumbai, Delhi, and Bangalore uh, in hospitals and COVID centers. So these were unprecedented kind of uh, initiatives uh, which we haven't seen uh, in, uh, in the past, uh, more so because this was kind of a black swan event as it is often referred to in the industry circles. Sure. A last example of TCS, another Tata company, uh, India's largest private sector employer with nearly 4,50,000 employees. They launched a massive program to ensure business continuity by what they call now as the secure borderless workspace model, which allowed these TCS associates to work from home with support from minimal associates working from offices. Another interesting thing that TCS did was about, uh, it was in the education space, for example, UNESCO, which estimated that uh, nearly 1.3 billion children would have disruption in education. TCS made its uh, proprietary digital classroom learning program available free uh, for these educational institutions. So each of them were kind of leveraging whatever core competencies they had. I think it's very important here to also mention about the civil society. Uh, for example, during the pandemic, Niti Aayog reached out to nearly 92,000 NGOs and industry associations. The Prime Minister himself reached out to a dozen leading faith-based organizations seeking their volunteers' help. And I think the responsible response was phenomenal. Uh, NGOs like Seeds or Give India or Care India or Goonj distributed lakhs of PPE kits, face masks, thousands and thousands of liters of disinfectants and sanitizers and sanitary pads, which was a very valuable contribution areas where the government was not able to do much. Right. And the important contributor was a social spiritual organization who had a mass base of committed volunteers. So for example, the Akshay Patra Foundation belonging to ISKCON distributed nearly 4.6 crore cooked meals and 3.3 crore ready meals to people during the four months of the initial lockdown. The Satisai Seva organizations, they distributed ration kits, which cumulatively helped in feeding five crore people over four months. So these are phenomenal contributions of corporations, MSME entrepreneurs, and of civil society, which provide us great learnings on how these organizations and institutions have come to the fore to address such a major pandemic. Right. So these are some, uh, you know, unseen, unheard of examples of uh, the way corporates, individuals, leaders have stepped up, you know, uh, in the times of crisis. Uh, very quickly, uh, Shashank, what are some of the key things um, in terms of crisis management internally that you think organizations can now look forward to engaging in for the purpose of building a, a culture of resilience, a culture of agility for the future? I think uh, one of the key learnings has been a change in the business model itself, whether it's the global supply chains in the manufacturing sector or the labor, labor arbitrage advantage we had in the IT sector, COVID has shaken us to a new reality where both of these may not be as effective as in the past. And so businesses can no longer assume the smooth flow of products and people across nations and continents. Uh, the emerging issues of immigration control, border protection and national security, or public health. These are issues where business models and industry standards have been thoroughly disrupted. So I think what is important for organizational leadership is to look at situations in a more contextual, proactive, and structured way, rather than ad hoc and reactive ways. The former is usually what is called risk management, and the latter is what is usually called crisis management. Uh, very often in India, we are used to crisis management because we don't give that much importance to internal, strategic, and external risks and proactively anticipate them. We need to effectively plan for them. And I think for this, companies need to move from a compliance uh, approach to risk management to a culture for risk management. Because uh, usually risk management is limited to certain silos. 
and primarily on preventable and internal risks. What we need going forward, I think, is enterprise-wide risk management culture, which helps in managing strategic, risk, strategic risks and anticipating external risks, uh, the kind which we are uh, currently going through. I'd like to draw the attention of, the, uh, of your participants to a series of articles I wrote for Business World on the theme of transforming crisis into opportunity. Many times a crisis can give you an opportunity to do something which was unprecedented, like in the case of Tanishq, where a crisis led to innovation and their entire jewelry business flourished in early 2000s, today contributing 85% of their revenue. Or in case of Cadbury's, where a crisis led to a product safety mechanism where they changed the packaging to make the product secure almost 20 years earlier at a time when their business was about to be shut down due to some major rumor about the way their chocolates are manufactured. Or for example, Tata Steel, where a crisis led to them laying off 40,000 of their employees in a very amicable way, which was ranked by Forbes as among the top 10 best business decisions ever. Or for example, at Starbucks, where a recent crisis led to diversity sensitivity among the employees. So there are opportunities where crisis can lead to a change in the way business is done. But I think what is more important is how we can manage risks more effectively and prudently. And for that, I think business school education should play a very important role because we teach in our business schools in a very siloed fashion. Whereas the decisions that are taken in the corporate world need to have a big picture and the students need to be trained how to connect the dots and take decisions that not just benefit the corporations or give them profits, but ensure the well-being of the planet and the people along with the profits. And I think they need to be trained to look at taking win-win decisions. Uh, that was the title of my second book, Win-Win Corporations, where companies need to not only ensure that they create value for themselves, but need to make big bucks by perceiving and avoiding the negative impact of the business and its decisions on people and the planet. And I think uh, what happened during the financial crisis was a bad model, a privatization of profits and socialization of losses. I think we can draw a leaf out of Indian conglomerates like the Tatas or the Birlas who've invested in the community much before commencing operations in Jamshedpur or Mithapur or Bablara or Pune or Hosur. These are great examples which are which can help us going forward. Uh, clearly, no, clearly some of the corporates have uh, you know shown the rest of the world, not just India, the path uh, to more inclusive development for all stakeholders and the public at large. You know, we've come to the end of the session. Just uh, I have two minutes left. Uh, what were some of your personal uh, learnings and takeaways? You know, in the last eight nine months, as a research scholar, as an author. Uh, what were some of the key things that you have observed uh, with people around you in terms of trends and at a personal level as well? Yeah, I think one of the, uh, the personal level, some of the key learnings were about the ability or the opportunity to relook at the way we have been leading our personal lives. Our typical work calendar with fixed holidays and mandatory commitments hardly provided us an opportunity earlier to look at life uh, beyond work and targets. I think during the lockdown, working professionals uh, have, uh, or rather prior to the lockdown, working professionals have always been speaking about spending quality time with family, but now they had to spend quantity time with them. So was there a change? I guess there was because everybody staying at home got to understand the strengths and weaknesses of their family members much better. And what came out was adjustment and sacrifice uh, the way we were used to in the old uh, joint family systems. Uh, I think uh, those uh, uh, working professionals whose spouses were homemakers understood the quantum of work that homemaker women put on a put in on a daily basis, which is usually ignored uh, uh, by, by working professionals because they don't know what it takes to be a homemaker. It's a 24 by 7 job uh, and a lot of commitment. And lastly, I think a key personal learning is about uh, the importance of uh, family health, uh, fitness and well-being. That became very obvious the quality of food we are eating, the quantity of sleep we are having, and the frequency of exercise all became vital parameters in our daily schedule. I think uh, one interesting development was a consumption of uh, less tasty but uh, proven remedies which helped improve immunity uh, became part of our daily menu. I came across one study that showed that the consumption of Ayurvedic products like Chavan Prash uh, went up by several notches 
uh, during this period. So uh, uh, three or four key things. I think the last point I'd like to mention at a personal level, uh, I have a lot of uh, uh, interest in uh, topics connected with spirituality. So this also provided uh, an opportunity to reflect on uh, some of the larger messages that uh, Indian culture, ethos, values, and spirituality have provided. Uh, that uh, our life is an opportunity to do much more than uh, eat, sleep, and make merry. Is there any way in which we can tangibly contribute not only to our professions, uh, but to society, humanity, and the world at large? And uh, it is in times of uh, solitude uh, when uh, such noble thoughts do arise, and you can make plans to contribute on a much larger scale. So that's something I could do, and I even uh, authored an another uh, self-help book uh, on uh, self-transformation. Uh, so that was one of the other uh, deliverables that my end, uh, personal deliverable achieved during the lockdown. Great. So you've had a you've had a productive uh, lockdown period, if one can say. Yes, yes, I yes I did, and I even started a series of short videos uh, on uh, uh, several issues connected with management and leadership, which I've been putting up on my YouTube channel. Uh, so your uh, participants may want to look them up. It's on Dr. Shashank Shah. If you type that, uh, yeah. the YouTube will come. And I look forward to connecting with them even on LinkedIn, where I'm very active, where I've shared some of these learnings through articles, uh, which they'll be able to benefit. That too is at Dr. Shashank Shah. Uh, they could reach out to me. Great. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and, uh, you know, some great uh, learnings from your end. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kumar. Thanks to your team. Thank you.